All right, today we're working on chapter seven. The topics are files and exceptions. Um, and the topics uh, that you see listed here are the ones that we're going to walk through uh, to various degrees. But basically, we're going to learn how to read and write text files, so files that are external to the programs that we write, uh, processing collections of data, uh, looking real quickly at command line arguments and why uh, people still write programs that accept command line arguments. And uh, then th this whole concept of uh, uh, exception handling, which is basically dealing with errors with input and output, uh, typically with any program that you write and how you kind of maneuver around that and don't get your programs to crash. Now, we just had this uh, uh, little talk in class before I hit record about this, this picture here. This is actually a picture of the Enigma machine. Um, which is the machine that Germany used during World War II um, to send encrypted messages and eventually, as they indicate here, uh, Alan Turing uh, uh, managed to crack their code and uh, there's that movie, The Imitation Game, that kind of covers this whole topic. Very good movie, recommended for computer people um, just because, uh, you know, technologically it's such an interesting uh, thing. Um, you know, and the funny thing about this particular machine is, you know, they uh, actually captured one and it's in Chicago, right? If you ever go see the submarine at the Sub Museum of Science and Industry, they have that machine sitting out, you know, because that's, because every ship and, you know, every, uh, you know, thing that they try to communicate would have one of these on board. Kind of a fascinating uh, device. All right, our, our topic is uh, initially reading and writing text files, really important topic uh, for the Python language. Python is a language that's used uh, quite a lot in the modern day for processing data uh, and, you know, and sorting and organizing and just manipulating those kinds of things, so that's why it, it's pretty important. Um, I was mentioning to the class here that in other languages, uh, I teach on an intro level. I sometimes skip over the file stuff because I don't find it as important as maybe learning about objects and classes, for example. Um, but in this language, I think it's pretty critical, especially if you're in the data science program here at Gateway, um, where that's kind of like, uh, that's what it's all about if you're in data science is reading in those files and manipulating them and, and looking at them very uh, critically. All right. Um, so the first task that we look at is how do you actually open up a file. How do you like pull it into your program? And really what we do is we use built-in tools that are uh, part of the standard Python libraries that allow you to natively read in. So just like we use the print command, you notice that they have an open command. And then the uh, open command inside the uh, parentheses, we're just passing into it the name of the file that we're connecting to. And I want you to notice here that it's just input.txt, right? So we are assuming that that text file, given the way it's listed here, is in the same folder as the program file you're executing, right? And that's where you s usually start. You start with files in the same directory so they're easy to pull in, just like you do when you're learning how to create web pages, for example. You don't like go five layers deep in folders, uh, you know, to find a file. Um, so you do something that's in the same folder. There's also an additional argument in there, uh, the R, and that basically, and it says it returns a file object. So it grabs the file, it reads it in, and puts it into an object that's then stored inside uh, a variable called infile. And a lot of the terminology here is kind of common terminology that's existed for, for a long time. So you'll see what kind of overlaps with other languages. Python has some quirks as to how it does this. So if you've ever seen this in a different language, um, you'll see some correlations. Right. The other thing that you'll notice right off the bat, you know, dealing with the topics of the chapter, if the file is not present, so if it's not actually in the folder, it is going to throw what we call an exception. Because you're asking for an external resource, and then if it's not there, if we don't handle that exception somehow, that, or that error, the program will crash. So as we're starting out, we're not being really picky about doing exception handling. Make sure that file's in there or you will get an exception. All right. 
All right, so we save it into a variable. And then once we have that red file into the variable, then we can perform actions on that variable, you know, to, I don't know, look at the data, print the data, whatever it is that we do. But the necessary first step is to do the file open, put the R switch in there, and it saves it into a variable. Next step, of course, is if you want to uh, do something to that file. So this is the, the next thing. So to, to open a file for writing, you provide the same thing, the name of the file, and you throw the W switch in, which tells it that we plan to write to the file. We're going to change the data in the file. So not only are we reading it in, but we're, we're putting it into a, a way that we can uh, mess with it. All right. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow us that capability uh, to work with it. Once again, we're storing it in a separate uh, format. And whatever you, like, however you're saving it in a variable, just make sure that your name really kind of makes sense as to what you're doing. That's why they use in-file and out-file, because the in-file just tells them, okay, well, this is just in incoming information. We're, we're not going to change it. But out file is telling you also at the same time that I expect to do stuff to this file. And you can use your own terminology, but that's kind of a little bit of a convention. Once again, uh, if you go ahead uh, and try to write the file when it's all said and done, it says that the, the file that you're writing to is going to be emptied before the new data is written into it. So whatever was there, you're blowing it all away. So you're reading it in, you're changing it, and then you're writing it back. Even if 90% of it is still the same, you're technically, you're still overwriting the whole thing. Okay, that, that's how the technology works. Another thing that you'll do is, regardless of what action you're doing with an external file, and this is true with database connections too, when, it, when, I, when you get to that point, is once you've read it in, make sure you close it so you don't corrupt the file. Right, so when you're done processing the file, you're supposed to issue a close method, which releases the file so other programs can mess with it. And I don't know if you guys have ever done that where, like, maybe you're copy-pasting something in your file system, but you got, like, your Word document is open, but you're trying to copy-paste it somewhere else, and it says, wait, can't do this one, it's kind of busy, right? And that's kind of the, the point. You got to close that file first, and then you can do other stuff to it. All right. In terms of the, the con the conceptual aspects of it. Here's a, a quick little synopsis. So the files that we're opening, the switch for reading or writing, variable names where we're storing it, read data from in file, write data to out file, close the files after processing. Pretty basic stuff. It's more in the actual doing where you get the, I think, the clarity here. All right, let's go to uh, reading from a file. And they have certain things. So once you have that file read in, right? So if you think about what we just did on the previous page, we opened up a text file with the R switch and we read it into a variable called in file. Now we want to go through and pull the data out of that file. So two separate steps. One is reading a file. The other one is actually going into the file and doing something with it. And we have a bunch of uh, pre-created functions that do the same thing. So this, this function here, readLine, is going to step through and guess what? Read each line in the file one at a time. All right? And the way that it actually works is when you look at a text file, and you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my, my notepad++ plus plus up on the screen here. I just so coincidentally happen to have it open already. Um, and I look at this like any any text file. So if I like you know put in like apple, you know orange, just for example. Now you see I have two separate line numbers here, and I didn't get to the second line by accident. I, I typed return right. I had to press return to create that line, and every time I hit the return, it basically puts in what we call a carriage return at the end of the line. It's a line feed, so it knows to go to the next line. And the read line function 
looks at that and actually looks for um, the end of line marker as it's reading stuff in. So it's going to read in the line up until that carriage return hits. So if you had, you know, apples, oranges, grapes, pears, bananas, you know, uh, there'd be a carriage return after it, each line uh, that it's reading in. And it says the read line method returns the text that it read, including the new line character that denotes the end of the line. So really what it's doing is it's grabbing a new line character. So it's converting the carriage return from the file into a new line character that it's actually storing. So as it reads it in, it says, oh, carriage return, slash n, you know. And that's how it's able um, to output the lines like this. All right. So if you keep running this process, y you should think to yourself, well, this is reading one line. What if I have a file that's got many lines? Well, this is where you start to use loop structures to kind of basically process the file. So I will, for example, uh, look at something like this, right? So we have the in file, we're reading a line, and then as we go through each line, we're storing it in a variable. And as long as that line is not empty, there's, as long as it's not a blank line, keep processing that. So whatever you're doing, printing it, calculating it, whatever it is, right? Storing it, whatever your action is. But each time you go through the loop, you're going to read the next line in. So you're going to process the line, and proceed. Process the line and proceed. Process the line and proceed. And that's uh, a real common thing. So what this is telling you at the same time is that text files in a way are kind of like an array or a list, right? So each line kind of becomes a separate entity and you can contend with it that way. I, and I think that's kind of fascinating. All right. Uh, ultimately, it'll look for uh, you know, an empty string at the end in order to move on to the next line and that's how it kind of functions. Now if you are reading in uh, text files that contain numeric values, from the aspect of the programming language, even if it's numbers, it's still treated as text. So if you are reading in uh, a particular line, you do need to convert it. So if you need it to be a floating point number or an integer, you have to do a conversion. Now you can actually kind of write combination statements that'll both read it in and convert it at the same time. Um, I always caution people, you know, if that, if that confuses you, the syntax of encapsulating all that confuses you, just do it in two steps. But that's pretty important. Can't always assume you're dealing with text. Very often you'll be dealing with numbers. Let's look at the process of uh, writing to a file. Uh, once something has been uh, opened and you're messing with it, in order to put output into a file, once you have that file loaded up, so this assumes going back to the first section where we read a file in, gave it the W switch to make it writable, it's being held in memory right now, and then I'm issu issuing the write function as a command, and then inside the parentheses, what string it is I want to push out to that file. In this case, we're going to write one line, hello world, and put in a new line character to take us to the next line. Now this is kind of interesting because when we were doing the read line, we don't like consciously tell Python to add a new line character in between each thing. It just does it automatically. However, if we're writing to a file and we want stuff to appear on separate lines, we have to issue the write line command, which then will put the carriage return in for us. And that's just kind of a matter of, of practice. It says here, you can also use any of the formatting options that you've learned. So remember like how you format money in decimal places and, and all that stuff? All those formatting commands, you can use in the output statements to write back to the file. So if you want to set something up so that it appears a particular way, you can use that syntax. And they just have an example here. And, you know, um, you know, I don't expect that you guys are experts on these formatting commands by any means, 
but at least you should be able to recognize them. Hey, that kind of looks like what we did in chapter two or something, and then you can go back and look it up and format it in any way. So th the point of that is, is if I wanted to create, you know, columns or I want to output the numbers a certain way and put things on certain lines, I completely have control over that. And sometimes the outputs are really simple and sometimes they get pretty uh, complex. The other thing that you can do, and this is kind of weird, is you can, there's a secondary way to kind of push stuff to a file as well. You can actually use the print command whose main purpose is to put things on the screen and actually indicate a, uh, an additional argument here where you say file equals out file. And out file, once again, is that object that we created by reading in the file. And so we can say print this, and where is it going? It's going here. So we can u actually use that print function to help us do that work. And just like you do with the print function, if you don't want it to go to a new line, so obviously this one will go to a new line automatically, because that's what print does, if you think about it. Uh, if you want to keep it on the same line, then you throw in that end thing with the empty quotes, and it'll keep the output on the same line. So you can kind of, I guess, programmatically control what you're putting into that file that you're writing to, and that's kind of cool. All right, moving on to the next uh, section here. So here they have a little bit of an example. Um, and they talk about having a, a number of different values. So for example, uh, you're reading in this column of uh, numbers. It looks like they're all floats. And you have them all set up when you read them in. And notice how they're kind of like jagged in format. In other words, 32.0 doesn't take up as much space as 115.0, right? But one thing that you could do with the output file is you could run a formatting command to make them all look the same and turn them into a nice looking column like this with two decimal places each and then also put in an output line where you go dash 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 and type in total and average and, and totally format it. Right, so this is just an example. They have the code for this right here on the screen. So they show you here and notice what they do to begin with is they prompt the user for the name of the input and output files. So if you're prompting the user for the name of a file, right, we're assuming the file already exists, right? So it's pre-created. So it's in your folder already and we're going to call it, you know, like, I don't know, hamburgers.txt or whatever, <laughs> right? And then they're also going to ask you up front for an output file name, all right? Then you go ahead and grab those and you open them by just simply taking the name of the file. So the user typed it in, in plain text, and then we're using that variable name to populate here to actually open the file for, for reading and open the file for writing. So two files to do that. They set up a couple of variables there to do the total and the count, because apparently we're gonna do an average or something. And then you see code that's very much like the code we just saw in the previous section where they have a loop. They read in the first line, stored in line. So the while loop will be forced to run because we have something in there that's not blank. And as long as it's not blank, we're going to take that value and turn it into an actual number for processing. Then we're going to write, we're going to use our formatting command to write it back to the other file. Right? So we're reading from the one file so you guys see what's happening here? And then creating another file with the output. So one's reading it in, the other one's formatting it and, and putting it into the other file because it's going to out file. We're adding up our totals, keeping our count, and after we do all that, we read the next line and we, and we just keep going. Ultimately, um, you write it all. So it writes the little dots that wrote, wrote all the numbers already up here writes the dots, writes the total, writes the average. Of course, it does the math, right? And then we close the files. So that's an example. You know, which, which files are we playing with? Uh, input and output. And, th and, that, and this is the part I wanted to show you guys too. So if you're working um, with this stuff and you want to try some of these, 
you can just actually hit the run button here. So let's let's do the run. Let's see if it. All right. So it ran it, and there, there's your output. So that's what it looks like. But I think it's kind of fun about this is in your book. If you go to your um, course shell, go to resources, and I just want to show you that I have the stuff here for you. There's this file here. It's a zip file, right? Contains all the in chapter examples, everything for the whole book, which is pretty cool. And I don't know if you guys have messed with that at all, and that's why I'm showing it to you. So what I have here in my uh, Google Drive is I have that folder unzipped, and if you go into it, and we're in Chapter 7 right now, and what were we just working on? Um, section 1, uh, Total Pi. So let's see, see if we can find that. Section 1, and there's Total Pi, and there's our input file, right? So if I load this up into, into Spider, Right, so here's here's a program that we were just looking at. You can actually drop it into your IDE and goof around with it, and that's I think what's really cool. Let's go ahead and run this. We're assuming it's error free. So what's the input file name? Input.txt. So I'm going to type it. Input.txt. Output file name. How about output? If I could type it. Yeah, I'm betting a thousand there. All right. What's what, what's wrong? It stopped. Did I do anything wrong? Well, you, you know that that's that's a quite that's well. You now it does. Check it out. Yeah, and, and Ethan's right on it, right? Yeah. Yeah, the output file, now it exists. Now the file exists, definitely. Let's take a look at what's inside these files. Input, okay, that's got those numbers, right? Output, not what you guys expected. You guys were expecting like a show in the console, right? But we're reading and writing files. So the output is actually in the file, it's not going to come up on screen. So it did the work, it formatted it just the way the book showed, but the output didn't go to the console, it went to the file. So a little bit of a mind, mindset change here as to how we're working. So you see the power of this, right? So we're, we're reading in a file, we're doing stuff to it, and we're writing a different file. Wow, that's cool. Isn't it? I think it's cool. I'm easily amused, though. So. <laughs> All right, but you know, there there's an example for you. All right, so that and, and that's the kind of stuff you guys should do as you as you go through these um, exercises in the book or your readings. Um, I would suggest to you uh, to try stuff just like that because I think there's there's a lot to learn by doing that. All right, let's talk about uh, this little topic here. And I love, I love that the author does these little sidelines like this, pointing out common errors. If you are reading in a file and it's in the same folder, you just use the file name. Great, perfect. All right, reality check though. Most often when you're running a program, the program, wherever you're running it from, is not in the same folder with your files. Then you're stuck trying to figure out the path to get to it. And on a Windows machine, which most of us are working on, a path statement to a file, it just indicates the location, looks something like this, right? So it's got C colon, our C drive, our main hard drive, backslash, but you notice how all of these backslashes are doubled? Now the reason for that is, is because this is a string of text, and if I put in a slash, I have to escape the slash, because otherwise, it thinks that an escape character is following, like slash n or slash double quote or something like that. So whenever you have to put backslashes in, you have to double them. Uh, but you can put in uh, specific path statements 
inside here. So if you have a, a text file, it's not even on a different drive. If you know how to get to it, it with a path statement, all you have to do is type it in. One little helpful tip is wherever your file happens to be, if you're in Windows 10 or uh, Windows 8, and, or actually uh, any version of Windows now that I think about it, when you're in the file management window, you just come up here and click into the address bar, not on top of any one of the items, but just in a blank area, and it will change your listing to a path statement that you can then just copy paste into your code. So if you know where your file is, you can just go there, grab the path, drop it in. Of course, you'll have to go in and double up all the backslashes to make it match up. Got it? Okay. <laughs> I'm sure he got it memorized. All right. All right, let's talk about the, the next uh, portion here. The, in 7.2, we talk about text input and output. Um, and they start to, to talk about you know the, the, how you go through the processing of files. And the first thing that they talk about is like you've seen how to, how to read a file one line at a time. And sometimes that's the thing to do, right? Sometimes you want to read it one line at a time. But if you know that you're bringing in, let's say, a text file that's got like 10,000 lines of text in it, and I'm just throwing a number out there, and that sounds like it's huge, but I'll tell you what, it's not, right? Because um, you can get files that are even larger. It makes a lot more sense to use a for loop because it allows you, once you've let, got that in file object loaded in, I can just run a for loop that says for line in in file, print the line or whatever you're going to do to it, but that's just the example they're using. And that will automatically go through every line of the file and print it out. Well, that's kind of cool, right? That, that, that seems useful. Uh, it's certainly a little bit easier loop to put together than the while loop. You know, functionally, I'm going to say it's not really that far off, but it's not, uh, it's not as messy, I think. Right. All right. It will, of course, do the same thing um, that readLine does, and that is it will actually add a new line character after each line but the problem is that there's already a character there that it's converting so really what will happen is if you have a file that reads like this the output will look like this it'll put an extra line between each thing and I don't know if you guys have ever noticed that like if you're working in in some text editors you know things like Visual Studio Code or brackets or Notepad++ and you pa paste in text from somewhere else and sometimes there's extra lines in between and then if you do it in Notepad++ and paste it to somewhere else the line breaks go away because some programs don't know how to read the line breaks from system to system but that's something that you need to um, be aware of now the good fortune is you know programmers have like run into this problem and they say well you know what um, we, we can write a, a function or a method, and yes, there's pre-created ones that allow you to get rid of that extra line break, and the command for that is actually R strip, and what that does is it just goes to the end of the line, it removes the new uh, line indicator there, and then you're left with just the string that you need. Because otherwise you're bringing in that encoding too, that's, that's the truth of it when you're reading in a text file. Um, the, the, the funny thing is, is that actually, it's not really altering the original string, it's actually creating a new string, uh, altogether. Um, and it also can go in there, and what's fascinating about this is if there's spaces at the end, and then the carriage return, it gets rid of those too. And one very, very common thing, folks, is when you're moving data around from different, you know, sources and writing them to other sources, for example, if I was to take, you know, the text on the screen and I want to write it into a database, the last thing in the world that I want to go with it is a carriage return, and for that matter, the spaces that go with it. So in programming languages, often when we're either getting stuff directly from users or we're getting it from a file, we run what we call these commands that kind of sanitize the data before we, we mess with it. The strip command, the R strip, um, will do that. R strip also has the capability 
uh, you know, removing from the end of a, of a line, you know, a carriage return or spaces automatically. But if you also wanted to, let's say, remove a period or a question mark, I could just add that little argument to it and it will do that too. That's kind of cool. So you can read in a sentence, it gets rid of the punctuation. Not sure why you would do that, but you know, or maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a good example would be like somebody's just typing in their middle initial and they type in the period and you just want to strike the period. That's just a, a primitive example. Um, the, uh, the other thing that you can do is you can look at um, various uh, formats for the strip command. Um, and it says uh, the first one, the L strip, it's a new version in which the white space, blanks, tabs, and new lines are removed from the left, the front of the text. Got that? That's kind of weird, right? R strip, the stuff is removed from the end of the text. Or you can just use strip, which I think most programmers would probably opt for, especially when they're getting user input, because it removes all that junk from both the beginning and the end. Because you guys think about it, right? Like if you like log into a computer or you go to a text box and type something in, it, you, you get, you're in such a habit of like typing words and hitting space. And then really if you're checking strings to see if they're the same and you type like, you know, John space is not equivalent to John without a space. So a, good, a smart programmer will run the strip command to get that stuff out of there, right? So you see that a lot in, in well-written programs uh, that people do that. They have some examples here of how that might work. Um, and uh, feel free to check them out and play with it. Some of that might be pertinent for the, our homework later. We'll see. All right. Next uh, section talks about reading words in. Now this is kind of fun too, actually. You guys ever like fire, fire up Microsoft Word and you guys, I don't know if you guys ever do this, but at the very bottom of the Microsoft Word screen, it's always keeping track of how many words, how many characters, how many lines, it, it like always keeps a count. Um, and really what we're looking at here is the same kind of processing. So in, in this case, you know, they have a little example of the poem here um, and it says, Sometimes you may need to read individual words from a text file. For example, here's our poem, and then we want to print to the terminal one word per line. So you have to re go in there and recognize what, what is it that separates a word. Well, it's kind of a no-brainer. The space usually sits in between words. So as we read a line, every time we hit a space, we're assuming it's going to a new word. And so for each word, we then insert a carriage return and so on. And believe it or not, they have functions to do all sorts of weird stuff like this, to process stuff. So the one thing that you can do is read a line in, line by line, and then run the split command. And what the split command does is it just looks for those spaces and then separates out the words into separate entities. Now, the one thing about this, though, is that if you're taking a line and you're splitting it apart, well then you either have to feed each thing that you're splitting apart into a separate variable, because you, you have to have somewhere to go with it, or you're throwing it into a list. So enter the, the usefulness of lists here. So what you're going to start to see is like sometimes when you're reading in external data, especially if you're splitting it apart, it might make a whole lot of sense to store it in a list that can handle something that once was a, a whole thing and now it's kind of separated out, but now it's still kind of a whole thing. So to see the, the, the logic there, right? So what um, they suggest here in that case is you can take that line, you run that line, run the split command on it and stores it in word list and then word list actually becomes a list or an array if you want to think of it that way, all right? Uh, the, the thing that it does note, though, is that the, the spaces are not part of the substrings. They are actually removed. Um, and, and really what the split command does is it looks at them 
as being what we call delimiters, then th and that's kind of an important word. A delimiter is basically any predefined character that we've chosen to separate things apart. In some cases, uh, you'll see people using commas. Sometimes people use the, the tab key to be a delimiter. Um, all sorts of things. Uh, but in that case, the split command uses the spaces as the delimiter to separate things out. The next thing it does is it sets up a, a for loop. You want to print out each word separately. You just, uh, once it's in the list, it's pretty easy to do. You just go word by word in the list and print it out, and each one would print out on a line. It says, notice that the last word in the line contains a comma. So if we want to get rid of that, we would also throw in the rstrip command. So get rid of periods, commas, question marks, and exclamation. And notice that that, instead of being applied to the line, is being applied to the word. Isn't that cool? And so you get kind of like, like this granular approach. Because if you think about it, if you're separating the words by spaces, and then you hit a comma, well, there could be commas in between words. So really what it's doing is it's grabbing the word with the comma and storing it, and then you really got to sanitize it one more step. Now this seems kind of like cumbersome, right? Because we're kind of like, you know, like very manually kind of ripping a string apart. But the reality is, is when you read in data from external sources, one of the most common formats, and I know the book talks about this, is what we call comma-separated values. In fact, most spreadsheet formats or database table formats can be output to CSV files, comma-separated values. And so it's a really common thing to sanitize the data because if you're like, let's say you're processing numbers, the last thing you want is a comma in there or whatever, throwing off the whole thing. It, it, it literally will break it. So what they then give you is this kind of modified code here that reads it in, strips the lines, strips the words, and sanitizes it all. So look at the code here. This, and this is, I think, a, an important example so we start by pulling in the, uh, the file. So we have lyrics.txt, we're opening it for reading only. So we open it, we store it in input file. Then for each line in input file, we read in line by line and strip out the carriage returns at the end. So we're separating out the lines. Then we run the split command on each line. So we're going line by line to do this that splits it all into words that go into the word list. From there, we iterate through the word list word by word and strip out all the extra junk, the commas, the periods, the, you know, et cetera, and then we print it on the screen. So it's kind of a little bit of a process, but this technique that you see here, it's not unique to this language. This is common in, in just about every language that you do this, that you're pulling in the data, you're reading it line by line, you get rid of the carriage return, you strip away the junk, then split apart the words, get rid of the junk, and then you're left with clean information. Right? In this case, they're printing it, but truth is you could also write it back to a structure clean. Right? So that's the other aspect of it. Um, and that's very much what we do in data processing. So a real, real common thing to do. So like, I, I think of like the people who are in the data analytics program that might be listening to this. <coughs> is this is kind of a, a first stepping stone for techniques to read in information from external files and, and do the process of what we call cleaning the data. Right, that, this is like the first step. The second step of it would be to take that clean data and write it back to a format that we can ne then manipulate further uh, and do all sorts of really cool programmatic things to it. Another thing that we can do is when we run these split commands, we can actually choose to have different delimiter characters in there. So the split command by default looks for space, but what if you know, whoever did our thing decided to use a colon, right? So you can actually specify that character here. Or as uh, looking into comma separated value files, you would put a comma there. That would be another option.
All right, so they give some examples of those. Show you how the splits work. Show you how to do it in a bunch of different formats. And I know you guys can read this, so there's no point in me kind of just reiterating it to you. So just take your time and read through those tables. Not that they would be on a test or anything, but you know, that looks like a good one for a test, right? All right. As we read in lines, we read in words. Uh, you know, we're splitting those lines apart to make them words, sanitizing all that. We can also read through the characters. And I think we've, we've done this already in the class where we take like a string and we read through the characters and we figure out the vowels, for example. Um, it is possible uh, to do that one at a time. And, and the way that you do that is you actually use um, this method called read. And then we're giving it an argument of one. And what that's telling it to do is just read one character from that particular file. And that's, I mean, that's kind of weird, right? You know, why, why on earth would you read one character at a time? Well, believe it or not, there's, there's reasons, right? You know, depending on maybe you're trying to alphabetize something or maybe you're looking for something that starts with certain letters or contains certain letters, so that's the why. Um, and then, once again, just like we did with lines, we can do the same thing with character processing so we can read in one to preset character as our sentinel value to run the loop. And then once that's preset, as long as it's, we have characters to process, we go ahead and do whatever we're doing and we just read one character at a time. Now that can be, you know, to do a lot of different things. A lot of different things we can do with that. All right. One thing that uh, you might do as you're reading stuff in, and this is kind of, um, kind of interesting actually. Uh, they have an example, it's like, what if you wanted to write a program that would count how many times a specific letter of the alphabet would occur in a song or a poem or a, or a paragraph or something. And what they do to, to do that processing is like first thing they're recognizing is we have 26 letters in the alphabet, right? Why don't we set up a list that's got 26 positions? That's what's happening here. So letter counts go from zero or we, we're going to have an array pre-populated with zero of uh, 26 positions. Interestingly, you guys know that all the characters on the keyboard by use of, or, or by virtue of like the ASCII key code values, all have a numeric value that correspond with them. And so you can actually kind of use that to your advantage. You look at the ASCII code and then you can actually figure out what letter you've read in, what its ASCII code is, and that helps to translate to which position in the array or the list it would go into to do the character count. So they give an example of that here. Um, I, don't th I don't find this like a really critical one to focus on, but I think it's a cool little example. So if you wanted a routine that would read how many times any letter appears uh, in some file, here's, here's your code to do that. So I think that's kind of cool. All right. <coughs> Next topic here is uh, reading in uh, records. All right, so it says the text file can contain a collection of data records in which each record consists of multiple fields. All right, so those of you that have done any database work or any spreadsheet work will realize that that's kind of the structure of a database. A database, for example, might hold information about you. So you might have first name, last name, address, city, state, phone number, just an example, right? And so one record in that database might contain that whole collection of information. Python is marvelous at reading in this kind of information as well. So um, they have, you know, their example is um, student data might have fields for ID number, full name, address, and class here, right? A bank account may contain records composed of a transaction date, description, and amount. Okay, those all kind of make sense. The, f the fascinating thing is, is they have a structure here. It says for each record in the file, read in the entire record. So all the related data 
that goes to one entity and then process the record. So they start getting into this like, kind of interesting uh, thing here because, it, as I mentioned, this is a, Python is kind of like the, the go-to language now for people that process large amounts of data and, and do uh, scientific analysis on it. And one example they give is the fact that they have this, this link here. And I'm, I'm actually following the link to go out there. And, uh-oh. <laughs> You know, CIA is onto us now. You can pretty much bet they're monitoring this. <laughs> but um, they have all this stuff in here, and I'm actually going to allow the Flash Player to run. Yeah. We'll see what, what happens when they, they kind of dissociate it. But uh, what they have here is this world map, and you can click on it and pull in data about any of the, the regions. So let's go ahead and, and click on North America. Right? And then you're in here and you can pull in, yeah, let's pull in Canadian information. I think the CIA would be less concerned that way. Um, and if you start looking at this, what, what it does is it kind of breaks down information about the, the whole planet, folks. This is kind of like heavy duty, right? Sources of data that you can look at that's official, um, right? And they have all these different categories but if you go back to the book right and it says um, they want to look at example of a file with population data from the CIA fact book all right so we we'd have to go in here and actually find the population is there anywhere here that we can find the population could it maybe be under people in society right so here's for example population of Canada but this is one little snippet of information so really what we're looking for is more of a compendium or like a combined version of all uh, the information so and I'm trying to figure out where they have it here because it, it's not really references regional flags countries definitions Maybe country comparisons, I'm thinking. And then go to population. And then all of a sudden, here's your data. You guys catching this? And you guys notice up here at the top, they have this little download button. Let's go ahead and actually download that. And boom, this is what we have. So this is just a, notice the file format in the URL. Just a raw text file. Right? Which means I can just as easily do a right click, save as, and it's going to try to save it as a text file. And heck, you know what? Let's, let's go ahead and download this. I'm just going to put it right on my desktop. And I'm actually going to change the file name. So, it, you know, I'm going to call it World Population with an underscore in the, in the name. So now I have this as a text file, and I can go ahead and, I'm not sure which program is going to open it, so I'm going to show in folder, and then I'm going to right click, uh, edit with notepad++, which is on my screen, number two. All right, so we go from this data source that we have out there to this text file. Now you'll notice that the text file, I'm not sure how they put it together, but I'm going to make the assumption because I'm, I'm arrowing it through it, so all of this is done with spaces. All the stuff in between. And the point that the book is trying to make is when you have these types of information sources, if I can figure out where the heck my book is, here it is, and you start reading the data in, and apparently, I'm, I'm thinking that the data format has changed since they listed it, but they basically have each country on a line. There's a line number, not sure why. And then they show the population. And, you know, kind of like a, you know, technical stuff aside, this is pretty fascinating. China has the most people in the, in the world, folks, right? 1.38 billion people. India's not far behind. 
not far behind. Yeah, and you know, it kind of floors me that right after that, the United States is third. That really kind of floors me. It really surprises me that we're third. I, you know, I, I have this like thought that maybe we should be somewhere higher up on the list. Yeah, I mean, th that's a significant difference, right? Um, you know, so basically, this is one quarter of the world's population. This is the next quarter of the world's population. So half the world either, either lives in India or China. Now, we have the good fortune, right, as English-speaking people who also code, because all coding is done in English, thank God. <laughs> Can you imagine having to learn Mandarin Chinese to write your code? Um, you know, with India, uh, India is a, uh, their official language is what? English and Hindi, because they were a British colony. So, you know, more than, you know, so a good chunk of the world's population thankfully speaks English, and you know what, even Chinese coders have to learn how to code in English. And I think that's, <laughs> it's kind of like an interesting kind of payback in a way. <laughs> right? Because before they can learn how to hack our systems, first they have to learn our language first. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, there there are there are, but you know what, you're not going you're not going from like a Latin language to another Latin based language. You're going from a symbolic language where a symbol is a whole word to an alphabetic language. Yeah, I know, it's it's weird. And I'm not saying one language is better than the other, but I just think it's fascinating. But the <coughs> the point the book was making is that apparently when they were reading the data and they were getting this. And I don't know, like maybe they pulled it from a different file, but their data was coming in like this. Like country and then uh, population. And so if stuff's coming in on separate lines like that, how do you, how do you process it and, and differentiate it all? Well, you write code like this, where it reads it line by line, and then it, it realizes how the stuff is split apart and then tries to organize it in the aftermath. Now this is the exact kind of issue that you'll get as somebody that works with data all the time, is you'll get all these raw feeds of data and then how do you process that data? What do you do with it? And how do you get it to make sense? And then how do you get it to work with your program to do whatever it is your, you know, your desired goal is? And, and that's one of the challenges of programming. So this example doesn't match the book's example, and unless they have like a different way to get the list where it comes in in the fashion that they're talking about, this is what we're stuck with. And so we could probably write code that would probably intelligently not read in any data, like we could probably write code that would ignore the first, I don't know, eight characters or something like that, and then ignore all the white space, read in the population, and then ignore everything after. So, that's, so we'd have to come up with our own logic to parse this and process it. And, and I just threw a word out there that maybe you guys aren't familiar with, the word parse, P-A-R-S-E. And that's a word that we use in data processing and dealing with text files quite a bit. Because when we read through a text file, and really when we're having a computer do it for us, that's called parsing the data. We're parsing through the text to extract the data. All right, we're gonna take a five minute break here in class, folks. So please uh, take a moment to stand up and walk around. All right, I'm gonna get started because our time is waning quickly here. Um, I'm moved on to the next uh, page here in the, in the ebook and they're talking about uh, this topic of reading the entire file and they give an example here where uh, we were going through and reading one line at a time. There is also a command called read lines, plural, uh, that will actually go through and uh, read all of them and then put them into a, a whole list if you so choose. And then of course you can go through and, and do the stripping uh, following the approach that they're showing here. Another real quick uh, special topic here on this thing called regular expressions. And I don't think we have too much time to go through this in depth, but you guys will run into this concept called regular expressions, it's been around for a real long time. It's kind of like a, a programming language independent approach to ensuring that the type of text 
that people are putting into um, a document or a form field or something like that uh, meet certain parameters and there's a whole syntax that goes with it. In fact, you can get entire, you know, like two inch thick books that, that talk about nothing but regular expressions. But they're equating this to this command on Linux uh, operating systems called grep with, where you can actually use it uh, to kind of control the input into files uh, and how you're naming things, uh, for example. So feel free to read that section. Uh, another thing that can get to be kind of important is this topic of character encoding. And, you know, I was just talking about the ASCII characters and how all of them have uh, numeric values that kind of get attached to them, which is why we can do some of the character processing that we can do, because we can convert to what we call those ordinal values or the values that number the letters and then do processing with that. Um, however, there's been a number of different character encoding formats out there over the years. And I know that those of you that are in the web program, which should be probably most of you at this point, are familiar that whenever you create an HTML document, you always throw in this meta tag up at the top that says character set equals UTF-8, right? And in fact, I don't know if you guys noticed it in our Python program too, but that our, our IDE also throws that in, which is telling you that it's encoding the characters using a very specific character encoding format. And UTF-8 is by far, you know, the, the standard or the most popular one that's used out there for all text editors these days. But there was a time uh, where you could actually work with various sets of them. And, and frankly, the, the truth is there is still, there are, there are still situations, I should say, where you might need to use other character encodings. For the most part, UTF-8 will be designated. The only reason that this is important is if you know that you're reading external files and that fall into a certain encoding format, you can actually add to the, the, the arguments the, the encoding as well. So if you know you're reading a web page, it's not a bad idea to, you know, to throw in the encoding to read it in as UTF-8 so it doesn't get misinterpreted. They go into a pretty verbose explanation about what it all means and, and really that's, even that's just skimming the surface, but that's about all the time that we have to go into it, but it's a good topic to read up on and know about. All right, so remember I was talking about uh, comma separated values, right? I know many of you have probably, uh, you know, worked with or at least maybe hopefully seen a, a, like a spreadsheet program like Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets or um, something like that. And, you know, when you work with programs like those, you have, uh, you know, pre-built rows and columns, three separate pieces of information, when exported to a CSV file would come out like this. So a string separated by comma, string, comma, string, comma, etc. And so if I would take this file and export it to a CSV file, this is what the text file would look like. And some, and, and, I'll, and frankly, some um, text files or, or uh, spreadsheets, when they export, they won't include the double quotes, and some do. Um, but anyhow, Python has uh, a lot of libraries built in that are able to natively read these files and without, um, you know, any uh, interpretation. It just reads them in. Um, pretty elegantly. So for example, um, at first it says you have to open it as a regular text file. Then you run uh, this import library that allows it to do the, the import and then it will go through and convert it into a cleaner format and it can go row by row and then transform it. And they just have some examples here. So I think this is pretty interesting. Uh, especially for those of you uh, in the data science or uh, data analytics program, excuse me, um, because one thing that when you get into the upper levels of that program, that's one of the things that we'll do pretty heavily is we'll lean on code like this to do exactly that. Because a lot of data that comes out of a spreadsheet, common form of pulling data in or pulling data out of a database will be exported as CSV files and then you need to process it and these are the, the techniques. So they go through a a whole uh, process of it here and they have some great examples so feel free to play with those and I wish I had you know a longer class I would demonstrate it but unfortunately that's not our our scenario we got to hit this material and get to the homework all right 
Another thing that we um, often don't think about as programmers is this, right? We've been running all of our programs right from the IDE. So we write the code, we hit the run button, and it pops up in the console window down in the corner, and we can see right away what's happening. The truth is what the IDE is doing in the background is it's creating its own command line interface, but I could just as functionally just bring up a command prompt inside of um, Windows here. There we go. It's being kind of sluggish. Yeah, I, I tried to run a command I shouldn't run. And I could do exactly what's shown on the screen here is if I wanted to run a Python program, I just go to the right folder, I go to Python, and I type the command Python space, the name of the program, and then I can execute it. But sometimes when you run a program, you can also throw these extra little bits in that are called command line arguments. And just like it sounds, it's like the equivalent of like throwing stuff inside a set of parentheses and sending it to a function. So what it allows me to do is not only run the program, but tell the program to do special things right from the prompt. All right, so for most typical users, if you're running a program, you're running one program at a time. And I'm not sure what dash V does uh, or input.dat does, but let's just say that, you know, it does a certain thing and then it outputs a file, okay? The, the point that they're trying to make here with it is for most users who are using programs, command line interfaces are irrelevant. Where they become really, really handy is the fact that if you can write a program and then control it from the command line, you can actually script it. And Python is one of those languages that's used pretty heavily uh, for scripting these days. So what scripting is, is where you can predetermine a whole series of actions. So just imagine this. If you had a methodology for pulling in, let's say, population data, and you figured out all the routines for importing it, cleaning it, organizing it, sorting it, doing math with it, and you wrote programs, you could just simply write a script that would, maybe one is like, import, clean, sort, organize, throw in the command line switches with the file names, you write it into a file, save it, you run it once and it does all of it automatically. You see the power of that, right? And that's kind of the, the point they're trying to make here. So where a lot of programming these days, we don't think about writing things for the command line. Command line programming uh, and, and considerations for it are, are not dead folks. There's, uh, you know, most of the most powerful operating systems on the planet, especially on the server side, are typically command line controlled and not graphically controlled because they run more efficiently. But that uh, capability is something that you can do with Python, and they have it, examples of that. But I just thought it's important for you guys to know that. They don't really um, do much more than that uh, in this case. They also have this kind of cool example that steps through um, how to process a text file. So they give you like a like problem statement, the step-by-step -step pseudocode, what, what your goals are, and, and if you wanted to uh, follow that example, once again, they're working with, with uh, population files. Uh, all of this stuff, are these are all examples that are in your book, so you can actually um, go to that source code that I showed you open this up and run it in your own IDE. And I encourage you to do that. But if you do that, make sure that you uh, read through it really carefully. Uh, another kind of interesting thing uh, here is they get to this um, example, uh, you know, believe it or not, yes, the government keeps track of the baby names or what people name their babies from year to year. To year. And I always find that really fascinating because I think of like, when my, my daughter, whose name is Zoe, when she was in kindergarten, and we're like, I bet you're the only Zoe in class. She goes, no, there's two others. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it's always really funny because it's like if it, like a show is popular or a movie is popular or something's popular in culture, <laughs> people end up being named that. So like, I wonder like in 2008 if there were a bunch of uh, kids named Barack, yeah. you know, or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. You know, people get in, they're like, you know, 
I don't know, Doctor Who's popular, so we yeah, named it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you name people like all these goofy names. Right. But they keep track and they have an example here. Uh, once again, a, work, a worked example of how uh, to work through a problem like that, including the source of data, with, which I think is really kind of fun too. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, when you get deep into this, this fi working with files uh, thing, there's a whole bunch of considerations to make. And once again, I don't have time to go through this in detail, but I just do want you to look at it. Um, so they talk about how you are working with files and directories and, you know, you can actually like kind of manipulate your file system and navigate it within a program just like you would from a command line. So like if you want to get, for example, the current working directory, you see what folder you're in, your program can read that from the system and send it back to you. Um, you can also change directories, uh, create them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they give you all the different techniques. They also show you uh, a bunch of commands that are really useful. So if you are writing a program, folks, you think of like the software that you use. Like when you go to any program, you know, even Spider, right? And you, you go to save your file and put it in a folder. There's all these things that happen in the background that you're not really thinking about. So like one thing is like, all right, I'm saving this file with the name one, two, three, four, five. Um, and how does how does the program know that that file is not already there? Well, there's there's commands that are built in that do exactly that. They can set the the path. You can rename things. You can you know throw errors if the stuff is already there, and that's kind of part of the the process here. Um, so a good programmer, if he's writing uh, a program that reads and writes files, will often use a combination of all these different methods here to do that. Right now, we're working at a base level. Just stuff in the same folder is fine. Let's just get it to read and process, and <laughs> we can move on from there. You know, you can ramp it up after the fact. It's not really that difficult. But they do have some really c good examples here that if you wanted to get deeper into this, it's right there for, for the taking, folks. It's all up to, up to you. They also do this really cool section here um, on encryption algorithms and kind of where they came from. So they talk about how people learn to uh, encrypt data. And the, the real notable one here is how in the late 70s, these uh, couple of guys came up with this a public key, private key encryption method, um, and you know it's it's kind of fascinating, uh, you know the the history of it all and how the technology works. So make sure you give that a quick read as well. All right, this section is optional. It's, it talks about uh, working with binary files, and because of our time constraints, folks. Sorry, I have to I have to skip over it. We have to get over to section seven point five. So take the time to read that one. Not that it's not worthy, but do you guys know what the difference between a binary file is and, and uh, a text file? Can you give me an example of a binary file versus a text file? Tom, you got to be able to do that. A binary file? Yeah. We know that any text file that we open is a text file, right? What about an image? That's a binary file. Some higher level programs will create files that have, you know, richer information embedded into them. That's, that's kind of the, uh, the crux of it. Executables can be binary files, yes, very much so. Because it's not like you can open them in a text editor and read them, right? Yeah, like if you look at the binaries of... You know, that's a really good point. Uh, executables are probably one of the better examples. In fact, if you want to give this a try, Use your notepad plus plus to open up a file type that you might not normally open. Like take an image file and drag and drop it in. It'll open it and it'll show you exactly how it's encoded. I think that's pretty fascinating, actually. All right, so we're gonna do this section pretty quickly. Um, and I'm hoping like 10 minutes or less here so we can get to some exercises. Exception handling is all about what happens if we are dealing with errors based upon input or output either to our file system or from a user. So an example, if you write a program that asks a user to enter an integer and they instead type, my dog's name is, you know, Bud, you know, which is a string, it's going to crash the program. Really what it's going to do is create an exception. 
And then it's a matter of what you do with that exception. So you can, you can write like an if statement and say, if this isn't a number, then, you know, give them a message. So that, that's a kind of a primitive way to do it. But whenever an exception is raised, um, you have to figure out really what to do with it. Because the last thing you really want to do is have your program crash because it's not interacting properly with uh, external data sources. So the one example they give here is like, so the, from a logic standpoint, right? You, you, go to the, you go to the time machine, or the ATM, excuse me, you go to withdraw some cash, and you ask to withdraw 500 bucks, but you only got 200 bucks in there, you know, that's a problem, right? You're not getting that money, sorry. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, it's not gonna make the ATM crash, right? So th that's not a bad uh, little example. But really the, 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 the thing that happens is, the now what? I mean, now, now that that's the situation, what do we do? You know, run away, hide, and bury your head in the sand, perhaps. Um, but that's a, a thing that you have to think about. So in terms of the kind of exceptions that a Python program can throw, the kind of errors that are typically triggered, this is a pretty complete list here of what we, I guess, call... Um, you know the majority of the type of errors you're going to run into. So you're you you're, you might get an input output error, and that would be one uh, that we get with files being input and output. If we're outputting a file or inputting a file, and it doesn't work, the you know it already exists, or the path doesn't exist, or that you know whatever whatever the case is. Uh, you also have math uh, problems. So like if you try to divide by zero, you can't do that. It's not allowable or if you're overflowing the data type that you're storing into. You also have runtime errors, right? And those are ones that um, are related to the logic that you use in your programming. Like the, the syntax is right, but what it's doing is not. <laughs> you know, the, the process that you're trying to make it do is not correct. Uh, we have value errors and type errors. And then we also have lookup errors where you're looking uh, those are all kind of related to like the structure of the, the code and the, and the data structures that you're working with. All right. So the whole point of the exception is what are you going to do if it doesn't exist? So they have this uh, thing called raise, which is what they call an exception object. And what that does is it gives you some sort of a message when something goes wrong. That's one of the aspects of it, right? So if the amount is greater than the balance, raise an error, and this is a value error. So what they're saying is, logically, that can't happen. I can't give you more cash than what, what you have in your account, sorry, it's not payday yet, whatever you know, the scenario is. Uh, and so we're gonna raise this error. What kind of error is it? It's a value error because you just don't have enough. And then you, you can decide what message you want to put on the screen. It's like you're a loser, go get a job, right? <laughs> or, sorry, you can't afford the expensive burger today. You have to go with the you know, 99 cent burger. Whatever, whatever your scenario is. All right. Uh, more formally, we have a different mechanisms that are actually built in. So in 7.52, they get into what we call two different types of uh, exception handling. So instead of like running a traditional piece of code and then uh, waiting for something to go wrong, they have this thing, and this is a common thing in many programming languages. In most languages, they call this a try-catch. So if you're in uh, like the Java class right now, you might be covering this, you might not. But a try-catch basically does this. A try is the code you're trying to run and the code that potentially might throw the error. So what might throw the error here is you're asking somebody to enter a file name. Or uh, then you try to open it, you try to read it, and you're trying to convert it. Any one of these things can throw an exception, right? With the, with the file name, maybe, they, maybe they're choosing a file name that already exists. Or maybe they're choosing a file name that's not valid, like blank, you know, for example. Um, they open the file and read it in. Well what if that file doesn't exist? They can't read it in, right? Or if it's blank, that might throw an exception too. 
or you can read the lines in one by one, but what if there's no lines? You see like all the scenarios, or what if you're trying to convert it to an int, but it's text? What if, you know, so how does that work? So any of that, so we try, in the try section, we try to do whatever code it is that we're gonna do that might cause the error, and then we have the accept part, and notice that it will deal with different types of errors. So you have to specify the kind of error. So if you're reading in a file, and it's not there, you're going to have an I-O error, input-output error. That's what that stands for. And then you get to choose what message goes back to the screen. It's like, hey, there's no file like that. So how, how can you possibly, right? If it's a value error, you might actually uh, type that out. And notice that whatever the value error is, you can also feed it into a variable. And then that variable will get populated with the system-level message so the same one that we would see in the debugger, and it would feed it in there, you can print it to the screen. So maybe the error is like divide by zero, right? That's what the compiler is bringing back. So you can say error, divide by zero. The truth is that most users don't care what the error messages are, they just want it to work. So if you're gonna give them some sort of a message, make sure it's meaningful to them. It's always my, um, my little two cents worth. All right, so they give some more examples here. And this is one format, once again, of doing what they call try, accept, we call try, catch in most other languages. So it's not unusual to see uh, statements like this. Smart programmers put, put these kind of things in to keep their programs from crashing, almost as a rule of thumb. Better IDEs will also sometimes point out that you want to add those things in. And if you work, uh, if you guys get to the higher level, of your Java programming, when you start connecting up to a database, you always have to run your database connections inside of a try-catch statement just to make sure it doesn't error out. Like, what if the connection doesn't work? You know, you don't, you don't want that program stopping to run. All right. Um, just about done, folks. The last little thing that we're gonna look at is an optional form of the try statement and that is where they have a finally clause and this is where python differs a little bit from other languages and so what they're saying here is that you can try a piece of code so for example this one's trying to write data to a file so you got this output file you get major changes now you're trying to write to the file but it fails right so instead of like throwing an error message what it just says is like, all right, well, if I can't write to it, just close the file. Done. Right? What they don't want you to do, where in other languages, they usually do try, catch, and finally, all in the same thing. In Python, they encourage you to not do that. Use the try with the accept statements, and then if you want to really use a finally, do it independently. They, they prefer that you don't do it and they, they have a whole little spiel on it. Uh, all right. And that's going to end our lecture, folks. And I know I'm being really quick about this, but that's a lot of material to cover um, in, in one session. And I'd like to get to the exercise. So we have a good 20 minutes left here. So I'm going to end this video and I'm going to start a fresh one. Uh, that's going to take me about three or four minutes. So those of you here in class that need a, a quick uh, bubbler or bathroom break or whatever, feel free. <laughs>